I had the honor and privilege after Gimel Tam was, and Torah Meaningful Life was published, so the publisher sent me out on a book tour. I didn't know what a book tour was even at the time. So I just, I, I complied, then I traveled, they gave me red carpet treatment, which only lasted for a few weeks, mind you, and that's it, and then I had to come back to reality. Uh, my wife and uh, my friends reminding me that I'm not a celebrity. Uh, so I remember traveling across the United States and the many interesting interactions, because rarely do you have an opportunity where two worlds meet. I grew up in a traditional Chabad Hasidic home and uh, environment, and uh, though we all work with people from all walks of life, but how many Jews that are sitting in this room, how many would not even walk into a room like this? Whether it's due to stereotypes or due to their fears or due to ignorance or whatever it may be. So I was able to meet such Jews because they would walk into a Barnes and Noble or a Borders. Environments where they went for perhaps to buy a book about auto repair and I end up being the one that's speaking there. So very fascinating interactions, humorous ones, uh, life-changing ones. And I want to share one or two that uh, I think are really valuable that can also teach us things. But here's maybe the funniest one of them all was uh, when I went to Lexington, Kentucky. You've heard of this city? It's the only city in the world that doesn't have a Chabad house yet. So it's unique. Now, that is, well, there are probably less Jews in the city than are sitting in this room. But that doesn't stop Chabad from going there because uh, there's, I think, opened up now Chabad in Antarctica. Even though there are no Jews yet, but they expect some to soon come. So, and, um, so I went to Lexington, Kentucky. I'll tell you how I got there, actually. I was speaking at a bookstore. It was called Joseph Beth. It's an independent bookstore in Cincinnati. And uh, Cincinnati is an hour away from Lexington, Kentucky, so they have a second twin store in Lexington. Now, not that you may be interested in trivia, but Cincinnati Airport happens to be in Kentucky, if in case you were uh, curious. But that's just an aside, in case you ever make that your way there. So I come to Lexington after I spoke in Cincinnati, and there I was just not really to speak. It was just to sign books. There's a thing called you sign books. You come, and they give you books to sign. They put a stamp on it, and officially you're supposed to sell more books that way. So I come to the, the, the front desk. My driver's waiting outside. I say my name is, uh, I say the name of the book actually. I say the book is Toward a Meaningful Life. Manager looks up the book in the, machine, in the computer and I see suddenly her face changes. Her, her whole disposition changes. I don't know what, I didn't do anything. And she gets on the phone to the manager upstairs and she whispers to her quietly, Rabbi Schneerson is back. <laughs> Because on the book it says, Toward a Meaningful Life by the Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneers. So I overheard what she said, I uh, smiled. Uh, you know, my name is on the bottom, there are smaller words. Anyway, the manager comes running down, and she's like saying, Rabbi, what can I do for you? We'll bring a coffee, CNN, we'll invite the media, you know. So I decided to play along, and you know, I, how long, often do you have an opportunity to feel like a Rebbe for a few minutes? Um, <laughs> It's a joke. Uh, so I decided, okay, you know, so I was quiet and they keep, they're like catering to me. It was like amazing. They, a miracle. Anyway, I, for a few minutes, obviously, I couldn't carry on the, mass, the, the charade. So I uh, said to them, I'm sorry to share with you that I'm not Rabbi Schneers. I uh, worked for him. My name is Rabbi Jacobs. But they were disappointed, I must tell you. And clearly they weren't Jewish, of course, you know. They weren't skeptics. So uh, I just shared this story. I shared this story without any interpretation. It's what happened. So that's my uh, Lexington, uh, Kentucky experience. So, and this is, uh, this is like three years after, <coughs> now is the 18th year since Gimel Thomas. This was like 15 years ago. Another story which, uh, a, a little different uh, angle, actually happened also with my book, but in a different way. My book was translated into many languages, and one of them was Hebrew. Um, and Chabad houses and different rabbis use it, for especially for, Israeli, for their Israeli constituents. So this story happened in Australia. For some reason, Israeli soldiers, after they do service in Sahal, in the IDF, they make their way to the Far East. That's where you have these big seders in Nepal, thousands of people in India, in, in Bangkok, in Sydney, and so on. So there was a Chabad house in Sydney, Australia, that was catered to Israelis, to Israeli young Israelis. And that was the, their main focus was Israelis that were traveling around the eastern, uh, Far East in Australia and other countries. 
this shliach, this Chabad rabbi, <coughs> he has several copies of my book in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's called Aderech L'chaim Shel Mashmut. And um, he would give them out, but then he had one left. So he decided, because he doesn't want to give it to anyone, he decided no one should make off with it. He punched holes in it, like you know in a phone book, and he tied it to the bima, to the, uh, to the table in the shul, so anyone who wants to read it can read it. It's all relevant. That's why I'm telling you the details. One Shabbos day, he sees after davening, a guy, an Israeli young guy, his early 20s, he's sitting and reading the book, as it was attached, I mean, with, with a string, you could read it, but you couldn't go anywhere with it. And after everyone's about to leave, after the Kiddush, the, Chab- the guy asked the, Ch- the Chabad Rabbi if he has a copy of this book, he'd like to take it with him. He says, I don't have any copies, but you can feel free to stay here all day today and read it. We'll be back later for the afternoon service, Mincha, and uh, stay here, be our guest. Anyway, they all left, and he left them, he, stayed, remain, he remained reading the book. They come back to Mincha afternoon, and lo and behold, the guy is gone, the book is gone. The only thing left were these ropes. I guess he found a way to, uh, you know, someone, he was in the Israeli army, he must have figured out a way how to get a book. Okay, so the shliach, the Chabad rabbi said, okay, listen, <laughs> could have been worse than that. A Jew wants to read the book, so he made off with it, fine. He forgot about it. A few months later, he was in Bangkok. In Bangkok, they had then a regional kinus, a, region, a regional uh, gathering of shluchim of the, that area. And who does he bump into in the street? This guy. It's over a year later. And he says to him, where, where, where'd you go? And where'd you do, what'd you do with the book? You know, he didn't, he didn't demand it back. He just was interested, like, what happened to you? So he said, well, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I, uh, I wanted the book. I didn't, I didn't want to spend all day in your, in your Chabad house, with all due respect. And uh, I, met, I went off with it, and, but someone stole it from me. I had a girlfriend, an Israeli girlfriend. We were in Japan. And one day, she disappeared, and she took the book with her. So I have no idea where the book is. One sec, it gets more exciting. A few years pass. I heard the story from the rabbi himself, the Chabad Shleich. He went back to Israel for a simcha. And he was davening in Kfar Chabad. There's a building called Beis Menachem. It actually looks like 770 built. And when there are weddings in that community, that's where the weddings take place. So he's at this wedding. He didn't go to the wedding. He was actually davening. And someone from the chuppah, a guest, comes in and sees him and says, you know, there's someone asking about you. He goes outside. He sees this guy. He's a guest. The guy who stole the book is a guest at this wedding. And he's excited. He tells him, you know something? You know what happened to the book? I want to show you. Listen to this. He takes him over to the chuppah. The kala, the bride is standing under the chuppah, all in white, near her, near her groom. And under her arm, she has the book, under the chuppah. And he could recognize it because it had the holes in it. So it was, it was, it was undeniably his book. Very strange. After the chuppah, the guest who knew her introduces, this is the rabbi, this is the one I stole the book from, the one you stole the book from me. So, anyway, the woman, with tears in her eyes, shares with the Shabbat Shliach the following. She said that when she finished serving in the army in Israel, she was at the worst place in her life. She grew up in a very unhealthy home, very dysfunctional home. She thought going to the army will help a little, didn't help. And she went off searching for herself to Japan, to the Far East. And then she met this guy. She said, I didn't really like him so much, but I liked some things he said. And he told me he takes it from this book. So we hung out a bit. And then one day I decided, you know what? I could have the book without him. So, what <laughs> so I just made, I took the book with me. And it saved my life. That's what she said, it saved my life. I began a journey. It made me think. I went back to Israel. I started asking around. Who is this Lubavitcher Rebbe? What does he stand for? What are his ideas? You know, where can I get more of what this book teaches? And I, I went to one class, another class. Long story short, a few years later, here I am, standing, getting married to a beautiful man who has his own journey. And these were her words. This is seven years after Gimel Tammuz. She says, I wanted to have the Rebbe with me under the chuppah. And that was the closest thing I could have. So I held the book. I asked the rabbi if I can do it, because you know usually you don't have anyone holding things under a chuppah, a bride and a groom. He said, absolutely. So that's what I wanted to have. I mean, the story speaks for itself. I was like, when I heard the story, I was like, you know, I brought more than one tear to my eye. I saw the power of uh, Emes, truth. Here's a rabbi. 
physically she never met him. You know, I wrote the book, I see myself like the Talmud says, the wine belongs to the owner and you say thank you to the waiter. So yeah, I served the book, but the ideas, the message, the truths are the Rebbe's absolutely. And above all, the impact on people, like in this story, clearly testifies to a power what's called Torah. I remember two days after Gimel Tammuz, literally 1994, that June, what day was it in the secular calendar? June, whatever it was, who cares? We know it as Gimel Thomas. It was Sunday. Tuesday night, literally two days after that uh, dark day, I was on Larry King and also Charlie Rose. Same night. And it was very hard, actually, because they asked to speak live TV to talk about the Rebbe a few minutes. And of course, they always had someone on the other side, but that person was not willing to criticize the Rebbe so close to Gimel Tom. So I remember Larry King asked me the following question. He said to me, I understand, and there's recordings, I'm sure there's tapes of it. I understand that Chabad community and the Jewish community are in pain, but why are you so shocked? What's so shocking? I mean, after all, the Rebbe was 92 years old. And this was, you know, you have to answer spontaneously, no time for thinking, I didn't expect this question. So what I said was, listen, you have to understand, for us, the Rebbe, and for anyone who knew the Rebbe, the Rebbe embodied Torah. It wasn't just a human being, it was embodied Torah. And the Torah had survived everything. It survived the Holocaust, the pogroms, the Inquisition, the Crusades, all the persecutions and executions and deaths and everything that Jews went through for thousands of years, the Torah lasted through it all. And the Rebbe is embodiment of Torah. <coughs> So for mortality, to touch something immortal is more than just painful, it's shocking. That's what I said, you know, and everyone accepted it fine. And I really want to share that because I think it doesn't matter how many years, 18 years, five years, five years, 100 years, obviously we all want and we wait for Mashiach to come and we'll be reunited with all our loved ones, the Rebbe and everyone. But the bottom line is something eternal doesn't die. And this is not about anything physical. We're talking about the Torah. We're talking about its message. And we're talking about its impact on us. You explain to me why four and a half thousand Chabad rabbis, Shluchim, with their wives and families, spread all over the world. And not one of them has quit their job. I mean, everybody goes through changes. Someone asked me this, a reporter, a cynic, asked me last year, he says, Gimel Thomas, he says, it's 17 years since the Rebbe is not here physically. And 19 years since he suffered a stroke. I never heard of a company that continues to move on without a CEO. Who's the CEO? So I said, there is no CEO. The CEO is the Rebbe. But you never, can you show me a company in the world that can have a CEO that nobody can see and nobody can speak to? And he wanted to know, what's the power? So I told him, you have to remember that the Rebbe struck them when they were young and in their hearts. And even the cynic could not deny that. He says, really? That's powerful. Because that's exactly correct. Rabbi Raskin can testify to this. Rabbi Hecht can testify. I can testify. Ask any Chabad rabbi. We're talking about 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. What do we know about life then? But at that point in your life when you're young and you're idealistic and you're a dreamer, you want to change the world. And most young people have no idea what to do. That's why there's a lot of rebellion, a lot of unrest and restlessness, and frankly, a lot of trouble from that age. Because hungry people cause trouble, mediocre people don't. What the Rebbe did was gave a cause. He ignited the soul in so many people. And when you ignite a soul, it never changes. And when you strike someone then, it's forever. And when you strike them with emes, which is Torah, and its message, it changes everything. And that's why it's not even a consideration for any Chabad rabbi, because then it's not, they don't see it as a job. They see it as their life's mission, their soul's mission. And they saw with their own eyes the Rebbe living, being a living example of that. Such eternity, such immortality does not uh, remain neutral. It affects deeply who we are. I heard this story from uh, one of the Chabad Shluchim, Rabbi Shem Tov, in Tucson, Arizona. So he told me a few years ago the UJA, the Federation, came up with an idea. Instead of behind closed doors decisions where, where they grant money to, to the different organizations. Why don't they, since it's public money, let's make a public forum and everybody from the whole Tucson, whoever wants, can come and let every rabbi and institution who wants money from the Federation make a presentation and, uh, and let the people, so to speak, let's hear what the people have to say. 
So he, he was invited as one of the presentations. He wanted to get his grant. So he gets up, and he, everyone gave long speeches and presentations and statistics. He just told one story, and he got the great, biggest grant of all. Actually, more than a story, an anecdote. He said the following. He said, why is it, why is it that when um, you, uh, God forbid, have to go to surgery, for surgery, you do a lot of research? Who's the best surgeon? You want to get referrals. You want to know their, their history. You know, you don't just uh, let yourself go to surgery without uh, proper uh, due diligence. And when you fly in a plane, by contrast, it's also dangerous. You don't make any, do any research to finding the best pilot. Whatever the airline gives you, you give you. You don't even know the name of the pilot until you get on the plane. Why is it? So he says the difference is very simple. When you do surgery, the doctor, no matter how good he is, at the end of the day, you stay, on, you're, you remain in, on the slab, and he goes home to his wife and children. The pilot, if the plane's going down, he's going down with you. So he said there are many types of rabbis in the world. There are rabbis who are excellent surgeons and experts and professors and philosophers, but they go home, and then there are rabbis that are in it with you. They go up with you, and God forbid, when things are difficult, they're there with you as well. And he says, that's how I was trained. And as a result of that, he got a standing ovation. And he got the biggest grant of all of them for that year. He said, the next year, they decided not to do a public forum again. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know if he, he had anything to do with it. But above all, you know, you can't tell the story every year. And I thought that it captures so much of what the Rebbe did. And this is also dispels a major myth. And many people think the Rebbe, everyone talks about the Rebbe. There's pictures of the Rebbe. There's... And some people, you know, sin skeptics say, what is this type of cult worship? Since when in Judaism do we worship a human being? Well, I'm here to tell you something that is actually completely counterintuitive. The Rebbe, if he was a cult worship, then there would be nobody around today following him because he's not here. But the Rebbe's power was that he empowered people to be leaders. He empowered people to find their calling. And when... They did that, a complete focus, not on themselves, but on what has to get done. It's exactly opposite. The reason you have so many people who talk about the Rebbe in that way, in a loving way, is because of the empowerment. Not because they are necessarily the greatest scholars and see the Rebbe as the biggest scholar. That too. But above all, his empowerment of human beings. The sensitivity. I am a personal witness, and I saw it day in, day out. I just heard a story just, when I was, I'm, just literally yesterday from Rabbi Lu. I asked him what the source was. I'm not sure. He said he'd get back to me. He said when the Rebbe was a child, around five, six years old, it's actually very appropriate for today in New York. It was a boiling day. It was a sweltering, sweltering hot day. And the Rebbe was walking, but he didn't just have a yarmulke on. He had a casket, a woolen thick casket that you wear in the winter. That was, I guess, his only hat. So in the same town where the Rebbe lived, there were a lot of what they call maskilim, enlightened Jews, who uh, you know, were somewhat dismissive of religious ritual. So one of these elderly people meets the Rebbe as a little child, five, six years old, and says to the Rebbe, you know, in this heat, why don't you take off that hat, that hat, that thick, that heavy hat? So the Rebbe said in Yiddish, they spoke in Yiddish, the Rebbe said, metarnished, not allowed. It's a yarmulke, they're supposed to wear a yarmulke, covering. So this, so this guy cynically tells this child, um, little did he know who he'd become, he says to him, I'll take the punishment upon myself. You could take off the hat. And the Rebbe's answer was, What difference does it make whether it's you or me? You know, sensitivity of a leader. It doesn't matter. You're telling me what he thinks about punishment. If you get the punishment, it bothers me as much as if you, I get the punishment. You know, they tell that, that joke about the guy goes camping with his friend. And in the middle of the night, they hear a, a bear scurrying about. So he uh, wakes his friend up. He says to him, you know, there's a bear. We got to get out of here. So, and he sees his friend, sees this guy. He's tying his shoelaces or his sneakers. So he says, where are you running? You can't outrun a bear. He says, I don't have to outrun the bear. All I have to do is outrun you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> it's called the survival of the fittest. You know? Survival of the fittest. Well, the antithesis of that is the Rebbe and everything the Rebbe stood for. We're all in it together, like the pilot. We're in it together. There's no such thing, us and them. You will not find a scholar and a uh, devout, pious Jew like the Rebbe. 
But you never saw this type of pulling rank. And it made no difference if a chassid who came over with a long white beard and was sat in Siberia in prison, or someone would come over who looked completely secular, it made no difference. Because the Rebbe saw souls. And when you see a soul, we don't know whose soul is greatest. And this, not that only the Rebbe saw it, but he taught us to look that way. Another story I just heard recently. Someone in his mid-60s came to see the Rebbe. He worked in the IDF, the Tzal. His unfortunate job was that he would take the, the census the, the, of the number of fatalities of soldiers who were killed that year. So he came, he was by the Rebbe in Yechidus, which is a private audience, and he tells the Rebbe, this past year, unfortunately, 30 people were killed. And I ask a blessing that next year it should be a lot less. The Rebbe looks at him and says to him, quietly, 32 people. 32 people. So he was wise enough not to say anything, but he thought to himself, this is what I get paid to do. How does the Rebbe know better than I what the number is? But he was very curious and intrigued. He comes back to Israel. He tells his staff, can you, can you make another, can you give me a final calculation? Because it wasn't so simple, because some people uh, are, you know, are unreported. Sometimes people are wounded and they die later. You know, there's kinds of ways to calculate it. And to his uh, surprise, or maybe not such a surprise, yep, yeah, the number was adjusted to 32. So this already was too much for him. So he decided next year he's going to go back. He would go annually. And this time he's not going to tell the Rebbe a number. He's going to just ask him directly, how did he know? So he tells the Rebbe that exactly that. He says, you know, last year I was here and I, and I said a number and you were correct, not me. How did the Rebbe know? And the Rebbe became very serious. And these are the Rebbe's words. He says, Alan Neshamas, was kum narayin de velt, was gay nareis from the velt, gay durach dem simer. Every soul that comes into this world and that leaves this world goes through this room. You hear these words? Rabbi Groner, the Rebbe's secretary, shared with me a similar story. That um, when he was in 1962, he told me, so the Rebbe would receive thousands and thousands of letters of people of all walks of life. So then in 62, the Rebbe said to Rabbi Groner that he should start indexing what we call today a database of all the content, all the names and addresses of people who write to the Rebbe. <clears throat> and the end of the year, the Rebbe says, I want to send everyone a Shana Tova card, a letter. The Rebbe would write a personal letter, sign it to everyone. And I want to send everyone that sends me a letter, I want to send for Rosh Hashanah, I want to send them a blessings for a new year. It wasn't a card, it was a letter. Okay, so Rabbi Goran began to collect, to collect them, and he started building these index cards. And after Shavuos, the Rebbe said he should start preparing them. And the summer... Let's prepare them in time. They can all go out in the mail before in Elul, before Tishrei, before Rosh Hashanah. So that's what he did. He brought them into the Rebbe. And one day, late, mid, late August, he comes into the Rebbe's room and he sees a whole pile of letters. The Rebbe signed all the letters. And there was a smaller pile, a very small pile on the side. And uh, the Rebbe sees that. He notices. So the Rebbe says, the small pile are the people who've passed away since you, since you prepared these letters, since you prepared these index cards. Okay, so Rabbi Groner takes the big pile, he's going to mail them, and he's taking the small pile, he's going to throw it out. And the Rebbe says, where are you taking the pile? He says, the Rebbe said that they're no here, longer here. So the Rebbe said, first of all, they also need a Shana Teva. They also need a blessing for a new year. The souls that have departed. And then the Rebbe said, on the address, and the address, where to send it, you probably don't know. So leave them here. You know? I'm not telling the stories just to give you some type of like spooky, mystical stuff, but these stories are empowering stories. You know, we live in a world where we can feel often very lonely. It's kind of called existential loneliness. And it's good to know that there's somebody that, that knows the address, so to speak, of our souls. And I mean, not just the souls when they're in heaven, the souls when they're on earth as well, because we can be here on this earth and also be lost souls. Someone that knows so when the Rebbe says all the souls that come into this world and leave this world, go to this room, it's a uh, empowering message. There was a woman who uh, unfortunately decided to marry an Arab years ago in London. It's a long story. I'll just tell you the end of the story. And the family was frantic. And they wrote a letter to the Rebbe. What could we do with her? The Rebbe suggested find someone in the family. That she was estranged from everyone because they all cut her off. 
So they find someone that still has a relationship with her. So they found a cousin. Tell her to go speak to her and tell her that there's a man in Brooklyn who can't sleep because of her. Yeah. So she goes to this cousin of hers, as uncomfortable as it was, she tells her there's a man in Brooklyn that can't sleep because of who you're marrying. So she starts laughing. She says, a man in Brooklyn? What do I care about a man in Brooklyn? So to let him take her sleeping pill. That's what she said. Anyway, to make the long story short, as I said, there are a lot more details to this. A few weeks later, this woman has a dream. And a man from Brooklyn comes to her in the dream. So she calls her cousin up, all disturbed. And she says, can you tell me what this, this man in Brooklyn, you know what he looks like? She says, yeah, I'll bring you a picture. And she brings a picture. And to, to her uh, shock, this was the person that came to her. You know, we don't understand the mysterious ways of our soul. But we know one thing is that we know a lot less about life than we think we know. There's mysteries. And each of us has a soul. Every one of us in this room has a soul. What does your soul look like? Do you have any idea? A Reb is a soul doctor. And he teaches us how to speak to our souls. How to communicate to your soul. Bodies we know how to take care of, hopefully. You know, your body's hungry, it tells you it's hungry. Thirsty, it wants to drink. Tired. You know, we have all kinds of bodily needs. Some healthy, sometimes not so healthy. But what about your soul? Happiness. Love, the search for God, for truth. These are all soulful things. There's no, no, no shelf, there's no store. There's no product that can be sold to you to give you happiness. The Rebbe was a master of souls. That's what a Rebbe is, a true Rebbe is. And he spoke to souls in that particular way. You're able to touch a soul because a soul speaks to a soul. But even stronger than that is he taught us this language. It's a language, the language of the soul. It's a language of sensitivity. It's a language of empathy. It's a language that doesn't bring the ego into the picture, that allows you to really sit down and hear what someone else has to say and care. How many people like that do you have in your life? Officially, people that love us are supposed to be that way. But you know, love is also complicated. Love could also be very selfish. Love could also not always do what it has to do. So there was this doctor that came to see the Rebbe years ago. And interestingly, uh, he, was, he lived, in, uh, I think, in India, Indianapolis. And someone there told him, you go to New York, go visit the Rebbe. So he made an appointment. Those years, it was not difficult to get in. He got an appointment. He sits down. He had no idea who the Rebbe was. Didn't know what he's doing here. The Rebbe offers him a seat. And he's quiet. So the Rebbe says to him, um, can I, anything I can do for you? <laughs> So he said, not really. He said, what are you doing here? The Rebbe asked him. He says, well, they, they, they spoke about you like you're like, there's not the, the greatest thing in the, on earth. They told me I come to New York. I have to come see you. So I came. Now that I'm here, I'm not really sure why I'm here. So the Rebbe said, you know, I'm not really comfortable with someone being here who doesn't want to be here. Since you're here already, maybe there's something on your mind. So he says, yeah, actually, yeah. Can you tell me who are you? Like, what's your role? What, what, what is your uh, position? And he said, the Rebbe's response was the following. The Rebbe said, I try to be a friend to people. A friend. A friend, this doctor looks at the Rebbe and says to him, a friend. I have many friends. What's so special about a friend? So the Rebbe says to him, let me define for you a friend. And you tell me how many friends you have. The Rebbe said, a friend is somebody that you can speak to like you speak to yourself. Without any defenses, without any fears, without being feared of judgment. Criti critique, someone that, that's if you speak to yourself. How many friends like that do you have? And the doctor just laughed and said, I don't have any such friends. And I don't even think that such, anyone has such a friend. And the Rebbe said, well, maybe that's one thing you learned coming out to New York, that it's possible to have such a friend. I try to be a friend like that to people. And if you think about someone's soul, not just about what you get from them, then you become their friend. You know, simple English. And the Rebbe's, this is the Rebbe's uh, trademark, be able to translate ideas that are profound, mystical, deep, in simple English. This, is, this reflects a concept in Hasidic thought, a whole thing about what a soul is, in simple terms, to be a friend to somebody. So we stand here 18 years honoring the Rebbe's, the Gimel Dam, Tamil. The bottom line is, I'm not trying to talk about miracle stories or other things, it's about us. It's about empowerment. It's about what we can glean from the Rebbe, how we can be empowered to deal with the challenges of our lives. So I would sum up 
There's many, it's very difficult to sum up a Rebbe, but we always have, we all have some practical suggestions. Where are we time-wise? How's it going? Okay. I would say two key things that I think are probably underappreciated because we don't give thought to it about the Rebbe that I want to really focus on. Number one is the Rebbe's war against apathy. And just let me put it into context. Context helps tremendously. You know, most of us, or I could say, speak for myself, most of this generation was born in freedom. We were born with freedom. But our parents and grandparents, and maybe some of you yourself, are survivors. Either Holocaust survivors, or survivors of Stalin. And if you go back a little, back 100 years, 200 years ago, Jews were basically under the oppression of some tyrant. If we were lucky, we had some benevolent despot or something that gave us a little breathing room. But for thousands of years, the temple was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. For thousands of years, maybe for a brief time, when King Solomon was around, Jews were not living in peace. I'm going all the way back to Egypt. We're talking about thousands and thousands of years. If it wasn't emp one empire, it was another. The Egyptian, the Assyrian, the, 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 the Babylonian, the Greeks, the Romans, later the Spanish, etc., etc. The first time in history that you can identify a free Jewish people begins in 1945. Not that long ago, right after World War II. We are now benefiting from that world. My father, Oliver Shalom, would tell me about the horror stories of living under Stalin, the fear, every morning, every second, not knowing when who's going to be arrested. But here, we can sit here in a shul, not be afraid that someone's outside taking down who came into the shul, random arrests, random murders, sh shootings. We take it for granted. I take it for granted, too. I heard these stories from my father, but it's still a story. The Rebbe came into leadership, the first leader in history, in freedom. And as a visionary, understood what freedom means. Understood things are going to get better. 1950, the Rebbe assumes leadership, Yutzvat, in this type of free world. Freedom is the greatest blessing of all. That you can send your children to any school you want. That you can serve and be Jewish in any way without anyone being able to do anything to you is a great gift. But the Rebbe also recognized the challenge of freedom. And the challenge of freedom is comfort zones. Apathy. You know, like the guy that said to his friend, he says, what's worse, apathy or ignorance? And he answered, I don't know, and I don't care. You know? <laughs> apathy is a kiss of death. You know, it's like, if someone argues with you, at least there's a sign of life. You share with someone your life-shattering, you share with someone a life-shattering experience, and instead of them, they, they yawn or they fall asleep on you, that's a kiss of death. What are you supposed to do with that? We have apathy. Apathy means my life is all right. I'm comfortable. What do you want from me? Yeah, when we're running from our enemies, it forces you to crystallize your values because you have to fight for who you are. Today, what does it mean to be a Jew? Ask this average secular Jew, and I deal with many, they say to me, I don't even know what it means to be Jewish because the only thing I know about being Jewish is that we're anti-anti-Semitism. That's what one Jew told me. What do you stand for? Not what we're against. Yes, we're against racism and discrimination and anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and anti-Israel. But what about what do we stand for? You know, they tell that guy the story, the joke about the guy gets up in the Knesset and says, I have the solution to all our problems. Instead of fighting with the Arabs, let's attack the United States. They'll beat us, of course. And then they'll rebuild us out of guilt and we'll become another superpower like Japan and Germany. Like after World War II. So an old Jew gets up in the back of the room and says, yeah, very nice idea, but what happens if we win? You know? <laughs> so Jews are very good in playing defense. We're survivors. And nobody can put us down. We figured it out. We faced the abyss and we've survived. Like it says in the Torah about Egypt. We grow, we flourish, we thrive when we're challenged. But what about when we're not challenged? When there's no one attacking our freedoms. It's a whole different challenge. Success is much harder than failure. 
Because then, what crystallizes your vision? So I submit here that the Rebbe in 1950, this great Rebbe, took upon single-handedly a war against apathy and comfort zones. And we saw this. The Rebbe, all the Rebbe's before him, the Friedrich Rebbe, you know the Friedrich Rebbe went through? I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine. First in Russia, then the Nazis. And even the United States, dealing with how difficult the United States. The Rebbe was a Rebbe born in Russia and went through a lot of challenges personally, but as a Rebbe, he had a free world. He could do whatever he wants as a, as a Rebbe in New York. And the Rebbe realized this enemy and would not let his chassidim and anyone that came close to him rest. The Rebbe then never went on vacation. Tell me a human being on earth that you could know where he was exactly 50 years ago on a Tuesday afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. People don't even know where they were a week ago. And many people don't want to know where they were. Here's a man that you can know exactly where he was at any given hour for the last 50 years, 60 years. That's, tell me, show me one person like that. The Rebbe single-handedly took upon himself a war, a much more difficult war. Because who's the enemy? There's no, one to, there's, no, there's no scapegoat. The enemy now is within and would not let anyone rest. And the Rebbe fought the war with the same passion as Jews fought wars against enemies, physical enemies. So that's the first thing, not to be complacent and apathetic. That it's our problem. We're not just observant Jews standing on the sidelines and watching. You know, we are active participants, proactive members in the community, and there's no such thing, it's not my problem. Everything is my problem. My father once told me he was, my father was a journalist. He was by the Rebbe in Yechidis. And the Rebbe, besides, besides his wisdom, also had a sense of humor. So he said to my father once, he says, you're a journalist, so maybe you want to do an interview with me, that is. So my, my father, you know, said, the Rebbe is serious? He says, yeah. So my, I could ask anything, my, my father said. The Rebbe said, that's an interview, there's no censorship. So my father, he had his questions. His question that he asked the Rebbe was, some people ask why the Rebbe does, behaves unilaterally, doesn't make uh, meetings and then the committees and uh, sifas and, and collaborations. He comes up with ideas and, just, and, set, and offers them to the world, does it all on his own. And the Rebbe answered him like this. He says, it was Parsha Shmois. The Rebbe said, in this week's Parsha, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu walks outside and sees an Egyptian hitting a Jew. And it says that Vayifan Koi Vakoi, Moshe Rabbeinu looked here and there, Vayar Ke'enish, and he doesn't see anyone. And then he attacks the Egyptian and kills him and buries him in the sand. So the Rebbe says, why was he looking around? Why does the Torah tell us that he looked here and there? He was afraid that someone's going to see him? First of all, it didn't help. Das and Vaviram did see him. They actually informed on him. And second of all, why is it important that he's thinking about his own skin, saving his own skin? And the Rebbe said, no, the meaning of it, I mean, Rashi has his commentary. The meaning of it, that one of the enemies today, besides apathy, are cell phones in the middle of uh, lectures. Another one. That's another byproduct of uh, the comfort zone. <laughs> um, so the Rebbe said, the meaning is very simple. Moshe Rabbeinu saw a Jew is being beat up. If I even cave a wants to see if anybody cares. So he's looking. Is anybody protesting? Is anybody bothered by this? He saw there's no one. So he did what he had to do. That was the Rebbe's response. To care and feel that your problem is my problem, and that we're all in it together, is the war against apathy. There's no such thing as my, we all go through times where we always need some help. There are times that we feel that things are going well. We have a challenge, and we have to take upon ourselves to feel that we're part of the solution. Because as they say, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. There's no third option. As the Rebbe put it, you're either influencing people or you're being influenced. In, media, in the media, they say, there are people who make the news, there are people who read the news, there are people who make things happen, there are people who read about things happening, and there are people who ask what happened. The Rebbe taught us you have to be a person who makes the news. We're proactive. That's one key message. And the second one, the second message is the sensitivity. The sensitivity. You meet somebody, you never know what's going on in their lives. We so quickly rush to judgment. Critique. You know, frankly, as good psychologists can tell you, critique and judgment is usually come from insecure people who like to point out on others things instead of looking at themselves. 
Rarely you're going to find someone who just criticizes someone else because they're looking for the benefit of mankind. You know, there's something that's bothering them. The Rebbe, the highest of standards, and never compromising the standards, but sensitivity to every individual, especially in our day and age when we don't know what people go through, the bizarre journeys that all of us have gone through. We don't know what people ha have endured. So to, to pass judgment, unfortunately we have too many judges, too much critique, and sometimes it comes from religious circles as well. The Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, and the Rebbe emphasizes it again and again, we don't know whose soul is greatest. And we weren't even given the, the job to know. In this room right here, who is the greatest soul in this room? After Rabbi Raskin and Rabbi Hecht. Who's the greatest soul? How do we know? We don't even know. What do we know about souls? The Rebbe taught to have that type of respect for the dignity of every soul's journey. And with that, I want to conclude with one powerful story also as a result of Toward a Meaningful Life, which to me was, a, uh, I would say, a life-defining moment. I may have told the story, but it's always worth repeating it. And when I was traveling, one of the cities was St. Louis. St. Louis, I received a letter when I got back to New York from a woman in St. Louis. You've heard the story. Um, but uh, it's a powerful story. And it captures the Rebbe's contribution, maybe like no other story that I know. A woman writes to me, and I know the letter by heart, so I'll repeat it almost verbatim. She writes to me, I'm a 47-year-old executive, Jewish, who came to hear you, and I was going to uh, approach you, but I decided better to put it in writing. Everyone in my city would say that I'm a success story. I made a lot of money, I'm a leader in the community, I work for a very prestigious co co company, built up equity, but beneath the surface, beneath the veneer, lies a woman in shreds. You see, my soul was murdered when I was a young child. It was murdered by my parents due to the abuse that I endured, physical, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse. And my life has been a living hell. Every day is a struggle. I've gone to therapy, nothing has really helped. Relationships are a mess. I don't trust people, people don't trust me. And I've given up hope. What I do is I wake up every morning, I breathe in. Some days I feel suicidal. And what I do is what people like myself do when we lack inner control of our lives, we create outer control. I'm super ambitious and driven. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It's to distract myself. But inside is a constant war against being, feeling self-loathing that I experience. Someone gave me a copy of your book. Though I'm Jewish, I've never been affiliated and I was reading, and a line jumped out at me in the beginning of the chapter of birth, and the line she writes in the letter she writes is, birth is God saying that you matter. And then she writes again, birth is God saying that you matter. And her third time, birth is God saying that you matter. And I will read the rest of my life, I will read this line as many times as I can. Suddenly, I, a, a, like a bullet between my eyes, something touched the deepest chord inside of me. That despite what my parents told me what they thought I was through their abuse, worthless, despite what the society tells us that our value is nothing more than a statistic on someone's balance sheet, that our value is based on productivity, buying power, looks, youth, your social status, despite all that, I matter to the one that matters most, God. So no matter what happens that day, whether I'm productive or not, whether I look good or not, whether I feel good or not, I was put here by someone who wants me here, and I'm indispensable in God's eyes. And then she concludes her letter and says, so though I have many years to heal, for the first time in my life I have hope. And that hope is, and the, the work cut out for me is, to create bypass surgery, to bypass the arteries that were infected by the abuse that I endured, and reconnect to the pure moment of birth. The moment when I came out from my mother's womb, like freshly fallen snow, when God said, I want you, I need you, you're my child. Birth is God saying, you matter. And then she says, so thank you for giving me back my life. You can imagine, I read this letter, I remember I was crying. I wrote her back a note thanking her and offering her my help in any way. I couldn't believe it, I couldn't believe it. A woman never met the Rebbe. 
sharing with me, of all people, a, sa a sacred uh, trust. And kept, I went back to read the book, even though I wrote it. And I remembered where I got that line from. The Rebbe didn't speak it in English. But there was a line the Rebbe would say all the time. You know, sometimes someone says, the Rebbe said so many things so often, you take it for granted. He would quote the Pasuk, V'amach kulam tzaddikim, Maisi yodil ispoir. Neitzim atoi, Maisi yodil ispoir. It's a verse. The Rebbe made it into one of the 12 verses that the children say. Say it, repeat it many times. You are my handiwork, and I'm proud of you. So when I wrote the book and it came to that chapter, for some reason I phrased it, birth is God saying you matter. Because I remember so many times at a Fabring, and I remember even the Rebbe once pointing at a Fabring with his finger. The Rebbe said, everyone here and everyone on earth was chosen to be here by God, and the mission you have to accomplish, no one but you can accomplish. No one that ever lived, and no one that ever will live can do your job. Not even Moshe Rabbeinu, the Rebbe once said. Because why would God send two of the same? Think about the power of this message. Imagine you would feel every morning when you wake up and you say, Maidani, thank you for giving back my soul, that I'm, I'm, I'm indispensable, that I absolutely matter. It doesn't matter if there's seven billion people on this world. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. You, you specifically have a job to do. No one can do it but you, nobody. How our lives would be different if that was our driving ethos. That idea that we're on a mission and that type of calling. So this letter captures the second thing I wanted to share, the war on apathy, and the second is the indispensability of each of us here, every one of us. That was the, the, the Rebbe's greatest legacy, that we today can be the arms and legs, the eyes and ears, and we can be a, a shlich shluchim. Shluchim is not just one person, it's seven billion people on earth were chosen by God to be here. Jews in their particular way. Anyone that has had the blessing to be exposed to the Rebbe, his teachings, his shluchim, the message, know this. But this is your birthright. Not the Rebbe, nobody gave it to you. God himself gave it to you. And the question is, are you living up to that calling? So if, any, if you take any message away from this evening, from this Gimel Thomas, just think about that. What is your indispensable calling? What is it, the role? And even if you don't have a complete answer, just think about it. Let it bother you. Make you a little restless, you're already halfway there. Shailas Chacham Chetzi Tshuva. The question of a wise person is half an answer. So hopefully we can take from this Gimel Tamas inspiration from the Rebbe in many ways. And there's an infinite amount of messages. I chose, to sh I sh I chose, to I chose a few just that we can, uh, we, can, we can digest and personalize. Because the bottom line is what it does in your life. So hopefully, if we can go away understanding that we have something to contribute, that nobody that ever lived or ever will live can contribute but us. Not our parents, not our grandparents. And this isn't about being arrogant, it's about being like a midget on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. But we in our capacity have something to contribute that nobody else can contribute. Just think about that. And second thing is, there's no room for apathy when you know that you're indispensable and you jump out of bed excited about how to take on a new day, then you're able to achieve anything. My father was once all night in Yechidus by the personal audience with the Rebbe, and it, got, it became the dawn began to break. And the Rebbe stood up, and like, as if he wasn't up all night, the Rebbe stood up, looked outside, and said, ah, these words, ah, a nayatog, ah, a new day. So may we embrace and reconnect to that type of vigor and that type of youthfulness and that sparkle to feel every morning when we wake up, not to say, oh boy, how, what's coming today, but to take on the day and say, wow, you know, carpe diem, seize the day, seize the moment, that this is a new day, new opportunity. You were given another renewed contract to accomplish your indispensable contribution. And the spirit and the mess and, the, and in, the, in honor of the Rebbe's relentless efforts, tireless, with people again and again and again, may we all be zeich, may we all merit to fulfill our calling, to do our little part, each of us an indispensable musical note in a large composition. And we need each other because the music can't be played without one of those notes. And we, need, and we need each other and everyone needs us. And together with the Rebbe, the master you can call it, maybe the master composer, of uh, these musical notes, may we be zeicher, like we blessed that 
to, the, to Mashiach, the coming of Mashiach, where every human being on earth will then recognize this calling. But we don't have to wait for that. We have to do our part. And our part actually generates, our part speeds that process up. And God should bless everybody here, the Rebbe's blessings to each of us individually, to all of us collectively, to those that merit to see or heard from the Rebbe directly. But those blessings continue on in our lives, in health, children, nachas from ourselves, from others, parnasa in this economy, you know, a uh, peace of mind and peace of heart in all possible ways. And God should bless us all to live up to what our mission that we were blessed with and do so all in a good spirit. Thank you very much.